Yeah, welcome to numerical methods. And we are still in our section on random number generation, but now we move a little bit further. So this is now about generating drawings of other distributions. So my section on random number generation was a lot focused on uniform random numbers. And in the background, we had this application of Monte Carlo integration. So now we are moving a little bit back to the Monte Carlo method. So approximating an expectation. And also we like to generate now drawings of other distributions. Maybe best example is the normal distribution. And for the normal distribution in the end of this uh, section, we have also some nice uh, code sessions. So we will apply this method and we will transform our uniform distributed sequence to a normal distributed sequence of random numbers. Interesting also, there are a few subtle aspects in this transformation, which link back to our session on computer arithmetic, so that you understand how the computer represents the floating point numbers and how the floating point numbers are associated with the random numbers uh, we generate. Yeah? So I have a few remarks on this. Let's first start with a small motivation also, yeah, mentioning maybe the most prominent application that we have in mathematical finance, derivative valuation. So the Monte Carlo method approximates an expectation of a random variable by a sequence of IID random variables. So that's here. And what we did when we moved to the Monte Carlo integration, yeah, we applied a transformation to our sequence of IID random variables. So there was here the F, yeah, the F applied to yeah, my sequence XI that created now a new sequence ZI. Of course, ZI is also IID, yeah, maybe has different distribution, but the sequence is uh, a sequence of independent random variables. If the XIs are independent, yeah, and we use this for the special case of a uniform distributed X, which then led to Monte Carlo integration. But of course we can use this transformation, F transforms the X also for other distributions. And that's very common. So for example, in many applications, we are actually interested here in calculate the expectation of a function applied to a random variable X, where X has a given distribution that is different from a uniform one. For example, it could be a normal one, a log normal one. Of course, our Monte Carlo method, yeah, approximating the expectation also applies in this case. So we have there the expectation of a function applied to this random variable can be yeah, approximated, okay? You have to be a little bit careful because it only holds in probability yeah, by taking now the sequence of drawings xi from x, yeah, according to the distribution, apply the function f and take the average of these values. So what I would like to discuss now is how we generate the xi. So how do we generate here the xi when xi has not a uniform distribution? Drawings xi of, yeah, uh, an example is a normal distributed x. So then we even have maybe parameters, mu and sigma, yeah, uh, or an exponential distributed random variable x with a parameter lambda. I have these two examples uh, in the script. Yeah, Of course, there are also other examples later, a log normal distribution. We apply a log transform and so on. Yeah, a motivation for this from mathematical finance is our universal pricing theorem. Yeah, you can represent the 
the fair value of a derivative, so actually the replication cost of a financial derivative, as an expectation under a special measure, yeah, the equivalent martingale measure, expectation of the future value, yeah, if it is just, a, for example, a European option, then the future payoff yeah, of this financial derivative. So indeed, you have here some payoff function. So this is here my V. v yeah. If you also include the numeraire here in this payoff function, you multiply with the numeraire at evaluation time divided by the numeraire at payment time. So that's the discount factor. Just focus maybe for a second on the V. Yeah, Then the V is, for example, for a European option, a function of the value of the stock. Yeah? For example, I pay you the value of the stock minus a strike price K. Yeah? If this price, yeah, if this difference is positive. So you have that the V here is a function, say, maximum of S of capital T minus K. And S is now a parameter coming from my model. Yeah? So we have to model the value of the underlying uh, stock and we apply a function to this. So that is here the first step, expectation of a function. And this function is the payoff of a financial derivative applied to the value of the stock. So maybe you could call this a function here. So this part, maybe you could just call it G. So this function G describes the financial product, yeah, the payoff of the financial product as a function of the underlying stock. The underlying stock S has to be modeled. An example for such a model is the Black-Scholes model. So another ingredient is a model for the asset S, for example, here, the Black-Scholes model. Under the Black-Scholes model, you know that S is log normally distributed. So if you take the logarithm of S, then you know this is, well, some constant added to a normal distributed random variable. So you have a random variable here that is normal distributed, and S is then, now if you take now the exponential function applied to the left and the right, so S is a function. So here this exponential of R times T minus one half sigma squared T plus sigma square root of T, yeah, applied to a normal distributed random variable X. Yeah, again, you have a function of a random variable. And now my X is normal distributed. So if you now plug this S here into the payoff function, I have actually two functions applied to my normal distributed X. The first function is here the H that transforms the X to the random variable S of capital T. Yeah, This is my model. So H defines the model for S. And then I apply another function, the G. The G defines the financial product, the discounted payoff function. And my X represents the stochastic driver. So the driver that creates the risk yeah, the risk in the stock, and then the risk in the payoff. Yes, actually, in this small motivation here, um, I'm already you know, decomposing my problems into parts that will be later important for the implementation. So having here these three colors in the implementation, later we will exactly create interfaces and classes for these three different parts. Yeah. One part is generating the normal distributed stochastic driver, the Brownian increment. We will have an interface called Brownian motion that generates normal distributed random variables using our random number sequences. The stuff that we will discuss today is also in there, how we transform to a normal distributed drawing. 
Next part that we will model yeah, is the age, the financial model for how the stock behaves. Yeah? It could be a Black Schultz model, Bachelier model, Heston model. Different models are possi possible generating the S out of a given vector of axes. And the next part in my framework, which I design, is then the financial product that can be applied to these models that model uh, this, the, the market, that model the S. Okay, so we have that our function f of x uh, is given as a g of h of x. And what I would like to discuss is how we generate now the drawings, the sampling of x. In the previous motivation, I had a European option. So you see the payoff here depended only on s at a single point in time, s at capital T. The Black-Scholz model had the nice feature that I could express s at capital T as a function of some model parameters, initial value, the drift, the variance, yeah, the sigma squared, yeah, or yeah, the diffusion coefficient, the sigma, the standard deviation, that I could express this yeah, as a function of a single normal distributed random variable. So this here is the Brownian increment from zero to capital T. Yeah? So immediately we make the big jump. Later we will have more complicated models where we do smaller time steps. In these models with a smaller time step, each time step is a normal distributed random variable independent of the previous one. So this is then a vector with IID components, each component being normal distributed. Yeah, IID, will, if the time steps are, have always the same step size, otherwise there is a scaling uh, factor. So this is then an example where we would like to generate a vector yeah, that has entries that are all normal distributed. In the standard intensity model for default times, so at which time does a company go bankrupt? So this is a stochastic time. You know, you do not know this in advance. Yeah? A good model or a reasonable model to start with is to use an exponential distribution. So in this application, I would like to create a random variable. This is here the tau, which is a stochastic time. So at which time is this happening? And this random variable has exponential distribution. How do you draw now a sequence of random times having exponential distribution? Also possible with the method that we will discuss today. And last example in the multi-factor library market model, you know, a, a discrete forward rate model where you model an interest rate curve. Yeah, actually, you have many Brownian increments involved. Yeah, So not only one for each time step, but also maybe one for each interest rate. Yeah? And this could very easily become very high uh, dimensional. So you like to generate correlated yeah, Brownian increments. So you have a normal distribution with a given correlation matrix. Okay, so that was just a small excursion or uh, motivation yeah, on some applications. So now we have a motivation to generate drawings of random variables that are not necessarily uniform distributed. I make the assumption that we have a generator that allows us to generate a uniform distributed random variable. Yeah. So we start with having the linear concurrential generators, having mesent twister. Yeah. So and now the question is, can we actually transform this sequence to another distribution? So you recall maybe that most random number generators generate integers, yeah. for example, here between zero included and m not included. Yeah? And we then use the mapping z divided by m 
to generate a random number between zero and one. Also here, subtle thing, often in these applications, zero can happen, one cannot happen. Yeah. So zero is included, one is not included. This will be important uh, later. The most prominent, yeah, and maybe also most simple, yeah, and very robust method is the inversion of the distribution function. So if you know the distribution function f of a random variable, or better, if we know the inverse, yeah, then I can immediately generate an f distributed sequence out of a u sequence of uniform drawings, where the inverse of a distribution function, maybe we have to define this, because the distribution function, recall what that is. The distribution function of a random variable, say capital X, is the probability that capital X is less or equal X. So for example, it could look like this. So the density, yeah, probability density is the derivative of this f. Maybe you also recall this. The density, say phi, is df by dx. So here the density is constant. So I have uniform distribution in the interval that I have just drawn. But it can also happen that the distribution function stays constant here. And this basically means that the probability to lie in this interval here is zero. No? Where the probability to be in this interval is f of x2 minus f of x1. No? So this is the probability that x is in the interval from x1 to x2. Yeah? And you see, if the two values, f of x2 and f of x1 are the same, this is zero. So you can have that the function is uh, constant there. Yeah, and how do you invert now the function? Yeah, The inverse it has now a vertical component, Yeah, and you somehow have to make a choice. Yeah, all these values that lie here on this line are actually possible for the inverse, possible choices. And we just maybe determine, yeah, to either use maybe the lower point, yeah, the first point where this happens here as the corresponding value of the inverse. So the inverse is not unique and we just make it unique by defining now the generalized inverse of f. Yeah, so this is our definition of this f inverse. Let f denote a distribution function. So this means the probability of x being less or equal x. And I now define the inverse of this distribution function, you know, this f inverse, is the infimum of all the x's where f of x is larger or equal y. So again, the picture that I had that I had before, yeah, with your distribution function looks a little bit like that. Okay, then here this set, the set of all values x, where f of x is larger than y. Okay, so where's my y? My y is this value here. I would like to have the inverse for this value. So this set is the set of all guys that were either larger or equal. Yeah. Why? So this is the set here where f of x is larger or equal y, and I take the x that is here the infimum. So I take this value. 
So this value is now my f inverse of y, yeah, because these are all the values x for which uh, the f of x is larger equal. Yeah, this is now making my definition unique. So here you have the corresponding picture. Whenever you have a horizontal line here, yeah, you would get a vertical line in the inverse and you take the infimum, the lowest point. So now I have to find an inverse of the distribution function. I need the following property. The distribution function is right continuous. And hence, in this definition, I can write here minimum instead of infimum. So the infimum is attained. No? So in other words, the x, yeah, the infimum, is in this set here. So this follows from the right continuity of the distribution function. So the distribution function is right continuous. Uh, by the way, what does it mean to be right continuous? Okay, if you take the limit, f of x plus epsilon with epsilon larger than zero, so you come from the right, then this limit is f of x. No? So it's continuous, but only if the epsilon yeah, is larger than zero, so if you can come from the right, right continuous. Yeah, how do we see this? Let's just uh, check here this difference. Yeah, so what is the difference of f of x plus epsilon and f of x. So we just plug in the definition. This is the probability that I'm less or equal x plus epsilon. So this is the set minus infinity to x plus epsilon yeah, included. And the other guy is the set minus infinity and x, x included. Yeah. So the difference of the two probability yeah, is yeah, like the first set without the second set. So I get the probability that my x is in the interval x to x plus epsilon, x not included, because here I'm subtracting it, x plus epsilon included. So now I let epsilon go to zero. Yeah, and to see since here this is an open interval, so x is not included here. Yeah, if epsilon goes to zero, this is the empty set. Yeah, no x is in this set. Yeah? Probability of the empty empty set is zero. Okay, so my function is right continuous, and hence I can write minimum in my definition definition here. So this will be useful. So whenever I use now f inverse, I will use it with here the minimum. So I will use that the infimum is in this set. So now endowed with this inverse of the distribution function that we have defined, we have this nice little lemma. So let u now be a uniform distributed random variable on 0, 1, f a distribution function, then if I apply my inverse of the distribution function to this u, I get a random variable x. And this random variable x has distribution function f. Okay, so applying the inverse of the distribution function to a uniform distributed random variable generates an f distributed random variable. So given now a sequence of uniform drawings, I just apply f inverse and I have a sequence of f distributed drawings, yeah, of drawings of this x. If the distribution function is continuous, you can apply it again to the x and you get back a uniform on zero one. Yeah, but I don't I don't need this. So we need to prove this. 
So first recall the definition of the distribution function. X has distribution function f. If f of little x is the probability that x is less or equal little x. First, I show that the following holes, which you maybe intuitively would expect from an inverse. Uh, if you have the inequality f inverse applied to y is less or equal x, then if you apply now f on the left side and the right side, you get, okay, f of f inverse, this is now your y, is less or equal f applied to the x, f of x. I only have this in inequality, yeah, due to this uh, fact, yeah, that there are certain intervals where f could create the same value and we just define it uh, using this infimum. But having this property here for this inequality, yeah, this is enough. So I need to show this first. Yeah? So this here is the number seven. So this will be important later. So I need to, to show this first. Uh, proof for this is quite easy. Yeah? Just plug in the definition, go from left to right, show that you arrive at the right expression, go from right to left. So from the right continuity, I have that I can write infim, um, that I can uh, write minimum instead of the infimum. So the infimum is attained. So my definition of my inverse of the distribution function, which I just have here, yeah, this is now take the minimum of the set of all xi where f of xi is larger or equal y. So this is the definition of the inverse of f applied to y. So f inverse of y less or equal x means that the minimum of this set is less or equal x. We have that the distribution function is monotone. Yeah, it's not strictly monotone, but it's monotone. So if the probability increases if I make the set larger, yeah. Okay, so look here, E of X less or equal X, yeah? so it's monotone. So this means if you look here at this inequality, so I start now here on the, on the left-hand side, yeah? so I have this inequality that the minimum of this set should be less or equal set X. So if I start now here on the left-hand side, then you have that x is actually in this set. Yeah? So you have here that this x should be large or equal the, the set where we plug here in this y, yeah? the set of all x where f of c is larger or equal y. Yeah, if x is larger than the minimum, all the values that are larger than the minimum are in the set, then X is just in this set. So X is now in this set. Yeah, so if X is in the set, you can just move it inside here. Yeah, you can just choose a C to be that X. Yeah, yeah, and I have F of X is larger than Y. Yeah, so applying the distribution function F to the X, I'm larger than my given y. Okay, this is the way from left to right. Yeah, So we are, we've done this direction. Start on the other side, f of x is larger equal y. Yeah, then of course, again, x is in this set of all the values for which f of xi is larger than equal y. So this step here is, is easy. But if x is in this set, then the minimum of all values that are in the set yeah, are, is less or equal x. Yeah, but that's the definition of the minimum. Okay, this step is also trivial. Okay, so that was the other way around. And we have proven seven. Okay, so my 
f inverse definition behaves like an inverse uh, i can throw it on the other side yeah if i have this uh, inequality relation here so what i like to prove is this lemma here if i apply now f inverse to a uniform u i get a random variable that has distribution function f okay the distribution function of a uniform is g where g is zero for x less than zero g of x is just x for x between zero and one yeah? density the slope is just one and g is one for x equal larger than one so this is the distribution function of a uniform so this means that for a uniform u you have that the probability that capital U, a uniform distributed random variable, is less or equal little u. This probability is just g of u. This is just u if u is in 0, 1. So the distribution function is the identity. So the probability that capital U is less or equal little u is just equal to u. Now let's check what is the distribution function of my given x. So I check now the probability that x is less or equal little x. Now I plug in the definition of the x. The definition of the x is apply the inverse of f to u. So the definition of probability capital X less or equal little x is now f inverse of u is less or equal x. Now I use the number seven that we proved before. If we have here a less or equal, yeah, then I can just apply f on both sides, yeah, or in other terms, move the distribution function to the other side. So that means on the left-hand side, I just have u less or equal f of x. Okay, so now use that probability uniform is less or equal a given number. It's just that given number. And we have that this is just f of x. So indeed, you have proven that probability of x less or equal little x is the given f of x. So capital X has distribution function f if the capital X is defined in this way. Apply the inverse of the distribution function to you. That's it. Very nice method. And actually, this is the method that I used in generating these pictures. On the left-hand side, you have a uniform distributed sequence using Mersenne Twister. And I just applied the inverse of the normal distribution function, yeah, so normal ICDF, to this sequence. I used a sequence of drawings of a uniform distributed random variable. And this sequence of drawing was internally generated by my pseudo-random number generator, by my Mersenne Twister. Well, does this also work if you use now a low discrepancy sequence? Well, now I'm back to the setup of random variables. Does it also work for low discrepancy sequences? Actually, yes. Yeah. Maybe as a little teaser, I show you the picture. So this is the result if you use, for example, the method on a Van der Korput sequence. Yeah? Van der Korput sequence, very nice distribution of the uniforms. Hence, I have not such a noisy block here on the left-hand side. This is a histogram, so I have a nice, evenly distributed sequence. And if you transform it, you get a very nice density, a very nice histogram for your normal distributed sequence, quasi-normal sequence. So why does the method also apply to the quasi-Monte Carlo method? Yeah, you can see this easily if you go back to 
Monte Carlo integration. Yeah. Using a uniform was the step that we did for Monte Carlo integration. So I, what I like to calculate is the expectation of a function f, little f here, applied to a random variable capital X. So and now capital X should have distribution function f. So this means that my little x is created by apply f inverse to a uniform u. Recall f is the distribution function of x, then phi is the density. Phi is differentiate f with respect to x. So if you have here x is f inverse of u, you have u is f of x. And then if you differentiate, you have du is phi of x dx. So if you calculate here the expectation and you assume that this is now here in just one dimension, then the expectation of f of x is just integrate your function f, well, of x, yeah, of x phi dx. So this is the expectation if x is f distributed. And now you just make a substitution. You move from the x coordinate, for example, the normal distributed random variable from minus infinity to plus infinity. You move from the x coordinate to the u coordinate. What does this mean? This means that you plug in here, x is f inverse of u, and the dx needs to be replaced by the du, but you know that phi dx is du. So you have that with the rule of substitution. This integral is just the integral over 0, 1. Yeah. Now f inverse applied to u du. And you see that this is exactly what we are doing. We are creating the sampling of our axis that we plug in by applying the inverse of the distribution function to a sampling of u. So now if you have this integral, apply the Coxma Lafka inequality. So I use now a sequence u one to un of uniforms. Yeah, I like to approximate this int integral here. Yeah. So this part here is now considered to be the function. So I use a low discrepancy sequence for my for my u here. So this is the sampling u1 to un. This is the discrepancy. And the function that I'm integrating is f composed f inverse. The Monte Carlo integral that you do on the left hand side is just take the average of all functions evaluations and function evaluation f composed f inverse of u is just f of x. So what you have here is that this xi is just f inverse of ui. So on the left hand side, you have little f of capital F inverse of ui, but you can write it as little f of xi. And of course, the expectation is just uh, this, this, this integral. So you see that this, this, this transformation that we do is in the context of the Monte Carlo integration. It's just the substitution. Yeah, it's maybe a little bit interpretation, yeah. Whether you use the function f composed f inverse applied to uniform 
or if you use the function f applied to an f distributed sequence that's just interpretation okay so the method also works if you use a quasi monte carlo method yeah well it's maybe just an interpretation if you use an uh, the composition applied to a uniform or the given function to a transformed sequence. Okay, I'd like to discuss this method with you now for the normal distributed random variable X. So I need an inverse for the cumulative distribution function of the normal distribution. And before we start discussing it in the computer, I have two remarks and on, on problems that you can see. And these two remarks already apply to the normal distribution. So the first one is that often you do not have an inverse of the distribution function. So it appears as if we make a very strong assumption here. Namely that we have an inverse of this distribution function analytically. So we can use it in the computer. Often a closed formula for the distribution function and the inverse of the distribution function does not exist. Yeah? Example is the normal one. So the most prominent example has already this problem. However, there are very fast approximations for the inverse of the distribution function. So usually we have very fast approximations. Now you can think what happens if this approximation has an approximation error that is larger than the machine precision. So then it may be tempting to use, for example, a numerical method to improve it. Yeah? For example, if you have an analytic formula for the distribution function, but the you do not have one for the inverse, you could think of using a root finder yeah, to invert the function yeah, instead of using some analytic approximation. And this is usually not a good idea. Yeah, why? Well, in first, in many applications, having an approximation error is not a big problem because often this approximation error can be controlled by the model calibration anyway. If we go back to my application, I have a normal distributed random variable with a certain mean yeah, and a certain standard deviation. So in the motivation, there was, for example, the parameter sigma in front of this normal distributed random variable. So that was, for example, here. We have this normal distributed random variable here for which I now apply the inversion of the distribution function to generate it. But there are model parameters associated with this. And if you have a small numerical error, well, you need to calibrate your model to the observations that you make on the market. And this calibration process will determine the correct value of the sigma such that the distribution of S matches what you observe. So if now the distribution of X is slightly off due to a numerical error, that can be often compensated by calibrating a slightly different sigma, which is often a much better approach than using some other technique to improve the accuracy of this approximation. Yeah, why is improving the accuracy of this approximation a problem? Well, it will result in a more accurate solution, but this solution is a discontinuous function. For example, if you have a root finder, finder, you do iterations, and sometimes you make 10 iterations, sometimes you make 11 iterations until you match the given value. But these iterations create small discontinuities, which can be a problem. So that's a remark. Yeah. So often it is much better to invest in analytic approximations that have a certain approximation error, but um, uh, instead of using a numerical method to invert this distribution function. So second remark is you have to be a little bit careful with the domain of the inversion. And this now links back to 
our uniform random number generators. For example, our uniform ones, they generate random sequences on the set 0, 1, and 0 is included, 1 not included. Yeah, the linear concurrential generators are of this type. Yeah, The first element of the Sobol sequence is a 0, yeah? but usually you do a little bit of skipping. If you now use the 0 in the inversion of the distribution function method, say for a normal distribution, then 0 maps to minus infinity. And 1 would map to plus infinity. So in my floating point numbers, I would get double negative infinity or double positive infinity as a result, right? But if you now think of an application that you value a financial derivative, for example, here, this example where I value, say, a put option yeah, that pays you the maximum of k minus s of t and zero. Yeah, in that case, the minus infinity for the s would be mapped to a plus infinity. Applying the maximum function would add to a plus infinity. And you would see that in your Monte Carlo approximation, so here below, you would suddenly get a plus infinity for this expression here. But if you have a single plus infinity in the sum, it will generate a plus infinity. Well, this point is very rare, actually, yeah, mathematically speaking, it should be impossible, but the random number generator can generate it and it com can completely destroy the result. So you have to be a little bit careful with the domain of the inversion and check for the limit cases yeah, that they don't destroy your results.